tell you, um, we're going we're gonna to talk. And uh, uh, I'm a, I see myself as a storyteller. So I'm going to share some stories with you. And then I'm going to shut up. And then we're going to open this up to the audience so that we can have a conversation. But uh, just to, you know, the little control freak in me, somebody will control, you know, make sure that nobody hogs the mic. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to also start off tonight by thanking the organizers for bringing me here tonight. Uh, because I know that's a hard job. Because <laughs> I've been doing it my whole life. <laughs> and it's so, it's so nice to come somewhere where somebody else did all the work. <laughs> you know, when people say, you know, Sherry, you have to go out on the road and that must be really tiring. I'm like, yes. I don't have to do the door knocking and the late letting and the flyering and the calling and... I can just come somewhere. This is, how, this is, uh, this is really awesome. Uh, like I said, with my big hair uh, in the movie. <laughs> see, I can't show this to some of the youth that are around our work because, you know, they can't see past my big hair. <laughs> we can never really get into a serious conversation because uh, whatever. Um, so I, I'm a formerly homeless mother. Um, I have two children, and uh, the only thing that I have in common, I have a couple things in common with Roseanne Barr. Uh, one is that I won out the nomination as the vice presidential candidate of the Green Party. That was one. <laughs> During the last elections, you know, I... I I didn't have enough spare time. I mean, I didn't have enough to do in my life, so I decided to run for vice president. Um, and then the other thing I have in common with Roseanne Barr, besides winning out the nomination, is that I did the thing that you're never supposed to do as a woman. I had a child when I was 16 as a teenage mother, and then I had another child in my 40s. <laughs> so Roseanne Barr ha and I have that in common. Um, yeah, wow, mm hmm Yeah, so, uh, so, you know, those two kids that were in there, oh, you didn't recognize the other one because he looked older than me? That was my son, too. <laughs> so I, I have two children. One is Mark, and the other, the younger one is Guillermo, the one with the microphone, no justice, no peace, like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I have two children. My oldest son, uh, Mark, and I, um, you know, I, as, a, as a young girl, I was removed from the household because it was during that time in history where they didn't have battered women's shelters. So the way that they dealt with it before they had battered women's shelters is they just took you from your mom. Uh, and I was raised in about nine different institutions before I was 16 years old. So literally my whole life, my whole existence is about, has been about uh, keeping families together uh, and finding home. So uh, I swore to myself, because I had that experience, uh, nobody, that was not gonna happen to me. And then I grew up and uh, you know that thing, unemployment, uh, losing your job, those kinds of things happen. Um, and I found myself uh, homeless with my son, Mark, and we lived in uh, a car that I managed to, you know, this is back in the day for some of you young people when dinosaurs were walking around on the street, um, where you could still like go into a car lot and be like, I, I sure I can make payments. And you know, they give you a car. And so bam, I had a house. Uh, but I didn't calculate that in the Twin Cities that I would get my second flat tire in a week and I'd have to leave my car on the freeway, and that was my house at the time. And then on one cold night in the wintertime, it was hit and totaled by a drunk driver. Um, and so there went my home, the car. So uh, I, I had heard about this phenomenon 
that uh, there was all these heated abandoned houses, uh, particularly in the north and in the Twin Cities. And uh, I tried to get into the shelters in the Twin Cities. I couldn't get in. And so one night I decided um, that I was not going to let myself and my son Mark freeze to death on the streets of Minnesota. And so we moved ourselves in. And then all my friends were around me, and I didn't know that someday they'd be called uh, organization. And I didn't know a few years later that would turn into coalition. <laughs> all these fancy organizing words. Uh, all I was trying to do that night was to figure out how to stay alive. And I, I told myself that as soon as I got housing, I was getting out of this job. And then I found myself, what is it? We found out the real amount of time earlier. What was it, 35 years that I've been in this thing? 35 years. I told them during dinner tonight that I say 25 to people that I've been doing this so that I appear younger. <laughs> but I've actually been doing this stuff for about 35 years. And, and so... Um, uh, we are creating what we call now the New Underground Railroad. That during slavery, people had to make a decision when you knocked on the door uh, about whether or not to harbor a slave, right? Well, we think that if we can't get men, women, and children into the shelter, and they could potentially die on the streets, or they'll continue to be victims of domestic violence, that we have a responsibility to house these families whatever way that we can. And so we're building that underground railroad. So you might be interested, or maybe you're not, but I'm gonna tell you um, how I live. I live on social capital. That's just about it. Uh, and my mom named me Cher, and thank God I learned how to share uh, because that's how I stay alive. Uh, that uh, at any given moment, I'm always myself, maybe two or three months behind in rent. Uh, a gajillion people live where I live. And, uh, and then, you know, I'm busy teaching people across this country how to set up homeless encampments how to take over abandoned houses uh, that are owned by the government that we just say, we're borrowing until you tell us where the families can live. Uh, because we think that we should live in a country that has a zero tolerance on homelessness. So one day, uh, you know, my you know, at one of the homeless encampments that we set up. Uh, there was a woman that came from Sweden and another woman that came from Brazil. And both of the women came down to one of our encampments and uh, they were both crying. And I was like, what's going on? Are the police coming? No. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> and they said, no. I, they said, you know, the, I asked the woman from Sweden why she was crying. And she said, Sherry, I can't, I can't believe that you guys live in a country where people would just uh, adjust to such a lower standard of living. And the other woman from Brazil said, oh, my God, I can't believe that people live in your country uh, alongside abandoned houses, and they don't just get organized and move the families in. And that always went click in my head. And I said to myself, I want to make sure that I grow, that I raise my children so that they have that same click that goes off in their head about who has set the kind of ideas in our head that makes it okay for tonight in this city, for this sister, or any other man, woman, or child to not have a place to sleep. So uh, I use uh, all the money I get from different speaking engagements, 
uh, and any money that comes my way, uh, it all goes back into the movement and uh, everybody that's a part of the movement is involved in the movement on the basis of commitment and not compensation. Well, you think that that would work out really well. Not when most organizing is set up around what's called the nonprofit industrial complex. I didn't know that there was so much, many rules to liberation. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I don't think like during slavery, people sat around and said, first before we run and get off of this plantation and get freedom, we first need to write a foundation grant. <laughs> and then let's see if we have consensus. You know, I joke a lot, but it's actually not funny. Because when you're homeless, you don't have a place to sleep tonight, and you don't have food to feed your kids. It's like a gaping wound. It's something immediate, and something that deserves immediate response and motion. So that's why when Virginia asked me to come and speak, and I found out that the title of my talk would be House Keys, Not Handcuffs, it fit me perfect. <laughs> because after all, I didn't know that my life would take me from being arrested a gajillion times, taking over abandoned houses and trying to house people in this country, it got to be to a point where I was arrested so many times, my poor lawyer, he would like hide in his office. Oh my God. <laughs> he pretty much had to get a full-time job. Sherry, the free client. Um, you know, so we take over a house and another house and another house and I get arrested over and over again, uh, trying to house homeless families. And it was amazing how it works, right? First you show up with like, 70 families, and they're like, there's no place for them to go. Uh, and then you take over a convention center, and then housing appears. <laughs> or you move children and women in front of the Liberty Bell. Um, and you know, they had everybody in their colonial garb, and the kids are there, and I'm moving the couches and the lamps onto Independence Hall, and, uh, and then, you know, the guys in the colonial garbs are, our forefathers fought for this country, and they're giving a history lesson to the homeless kids that are sitting there on the couches and stuff that we're putting out on the lawn, and then um, the next thing you know, the guy that's talking about fighting for our country holds on to his wig, turns around and sees the entire police force coming down the, the lawn, and uh, the guys in the colonial garb start hightailing it off, of the, <laughs> off the lawn. Um, uh, yeah, and so um, I did six months daily reporting probation for a very serious crime obstructing the view of the Liberty Bell. <laughs> I wish I was lying about this, but I was, you know, um, I really felt like um, the, the song Banned in the USA, that I owned that on Independence Hall, because I was banned uh, from Independence Hall for about over a year. Uh, after I did my six months of daily uh, federal reporting probation for obstructing the view of the Liberty Bell. Uh, because it was, you know, you should have seen my trial. It was wonderful. I mean, people took the stand and a woman from, I came all the way from Kansas uh, to show my children the historical sites and I had to see this site. <laughs> Homelessness. <laughs> So, yes. Um, so, you know, I've had a lot of, I had a lot of those handcuff experiences. 
So, uh, you know, I just had to make it even better. Uh, so while, one day while I was sitting in my office and, uh, you know, I was doing all the various different things, um, there was these interesting people that came in uh, to my office and they sat down and they said, hi, Sherry, um, we're here and we're from the Green Party. I was like, oh, interesting, politicians, I hate them all. They said, we have a great idea for you. And I said, what? And they said, well, we have this idea that if you decided to run for political office, you could take the issue of foreclosures and bring it to the national arena. Um, and so what I decided, I said, wow, well, this is interesting. Tell me more about this Green Party. And they said, well, they don't take any money from corporations, and uh, here's their program, and they do wonderful things, and blah, 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 blah. And I said, wow, this is, this is interesting. You mean there's a political party besides the one party in our country? Uh, and they said, yeah. So I said, oh, OK, well, that's interesting, too. And I said, well, what office would you like me to run for? And they said, sheriff. And I said, Oh my God. <laughs> I said, maybe you need to vet me a little better. <laughs> I mean, I am familiar with the Sheriff's Department and what they do. I've been transported by them my whole life. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I did further research and I came to learn that in the South, that during the intense lynching period, many people from the African-American community ran for sheriff out of necessity to try and stop the lynching in the South. And I said, wow, I can take a lesson out of history. Hmm, if I become sheriff, I can just put a moratorium on all evictions and end homelessness. Right? So that's what I did. I ran for sheriff on a zero foreclosures and evictions platform. And I also ran on a platform that I would refuse to work with ICE and would refuse to deport any undocumented immigrants. Now, needless to say, this was a little difficult thing, um, trying to get the hood where I lived uh, to unite around me running for some kind of law enforcement. Uh, so, you know, I did what you needed to do, which is, um, you know, ask the guys down the street that are hustlers if I could borrow their horse. Um, and I rode through the streets of Kensington on a horse <laughs> with a cowboy hat and hip hop music behind me. Playing I Shot the Sheriff <laughs> and proclaiming to everybody in Philadelphia that I was the new sheriff, the people sheriff that why couldn't we have a sheriff that is there to protect the people from corporations, speculators, and developers? <laughs> and refuse to throw families out of their homes. Well, needless to say, debates would pop off everywhere that I spoke. And they even wrote an editorial they said, oh my God, if Sherry does this, you know what will happen? People will stop paying their rent. <laughs> people that are in for the million people that are in foreclosure in this country will just stay in their homes. Ha, ah. <laughs> Boy, Rosa Parks, look out. Million people. In foreclosure, what would happen if they just decided 
We're not going to go. How are you going to force that? Well, needless to say, I didn't win sheriff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was a sad day when I had to post on Facebook that the guy that won against me uh, is under federal indictment. <laughs> I told you so. Yes, yes. First, it, the first sheriff, he lost because he stole a bunch of money. They passed out a bunch of houses. Then the next guy, Sheriff Williams, now he's under investigation. What are you going to do? So anyway, so that wasn't enough for me, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, during the foreclosure crisis, that kind of stuff, uh, we took a page again out of history. Uh, as soon as they throw a family stuff out on the front, front of the street, then we say, we got them, the trucks will go away, we reopen the doors, move the families back in. Um, and I'm just saying, you know, on the boards that they board up after they close the houses and take the houses away from families, there was these graffiti messages showing up all the place in Philadelphia. I don't know how I got there, saying, please don't buy this house. They threw out a family. I don't know to this day how that got there. <laughs> and then, as time went on, uh, I had a, another encounter uh, with the Green Party. Uh, I received a, a phone call from Dr. Jill Stein, uh, who was the last presidential uh, candidate of the Green Party, and she's a, a doctor, a very smart woman. And uh, uh, her husband's a surgeon. Uh, we both have a lot in common. <laughs> she's from Harvard. I'm from the School of Hard Knocks. And uh, she said, you know, Sherry, uh, I don't want you to tell anybody this, uh, but you're on my short list uh, to be my vice presidential running mate. And I said, oh, wow, this is exciting. I won't tell anybody. Uh, so she hung up the phone. I called everybody I know. <laughs> said, oh, my god, I got a call from Jill Stein. They want me to be the vice presidential running mate. And I said to myself in my heart, oh, thank God, it's really not going to happen because as soon as they vet me, uh, there's no way I'm going to be chosen. Uh, so my ego filled the room and that kind of stuff. And I was able to tell my friends, "Woo, this is really great. And then the most horrible day of my life happened. Uh, Jill called me back and said, you've been chosen. And I was absolutely t terrified. It was like a, a truck hit me or something. Uh, and then I began the very um, easy process of running for running as a vice presidential candidate of this country. As the first formerly homeless woman in the country. And I don't know if you guys know about this. But some people got an attitude with homeless people. <laughs> Not to mention there had been a book that I was written about in called Myth of the Welfare Queen. So, and then, I mean, my gosh, like everything you're never supposed to do in life, I did it 10 times. And yet I was chosen. So. Uh, you know, I just had to create a shield over my heart and get in front of audiences and, like, get ready for the boxing ring, right? And what I felt, found was something very different. I found people embracing me and uniting with the things I was saying. And so it was, a, it was an amazing uh, experience. But then those damn handcuffs came again. <laughs> And so uh, here it was. Uh, 
uh, we were we found out that just because we were on 85% of the ballots in the 85% con- of the country could vote for us and we were on ballots across the entire country and my uh, African American lesbian uh, niece took a photograph and sent it to me and said uh, Auntie Sherry you're going to be my first person that I'm able able to ever vote for I was like, what do you mean we can't participate in the debates? And then I went through a serious loss of innocence because I came to learn that 10 corporations determine who gets to be a part of the presidential debates. It didn't matter how many petitions you got signed It didn't matter what you had to say. It didn't matter. Any of those things didn't matter. So on a lovely day, I went with my running mate, uh, uh, Jill Stein, and we walked onto the public campus, and we decided we were going to go there uh, to demand that we be a part of the debates. Well, within five seconds, uh, we were met by the, with those really scary guys with the sunglasses and the little thing in their ear. Scary. And they put us, you know, they, the Secret Service whisked us away, put us in cars, drove us to the middle of the university uh, where there was Winnebago's waiting for us and uh, put us in the little Winnebago's, which were like CSI or something, taking all these pictures and uh, printing us and all of those kinds of things. And uh, then they put us in the vehicle and they drove us 10 miles away into a warehouse and handcuffed us sideways during the last presidential debates. Now, during that period, Jill, not familiar with the 200 arrests that I've had. I mean, she knew about them, but she didn't have a similar experience. Said, I would like to talk to somebody in charge. (laughs) Any of you that have had a similar experience uh, being arrested, you know If they ask you to bark, roll over, play dead, that's exactly what you do. And being that there was no other witnesses there, and there was about 20 Secret Service guys, and Jill and I, and we were handcuffed sideways to the chair, I was like, Jill, don't you think they can make us disappear? (laughs) And so the guy came over, one of the guys came over and said, what would you like? And then he walked over to his friends, and then there was a huge uproar of laughter. <laughs> and then he came back, and he said, no. And then Jill understood for the rest of the night uh, that we would just have to be sideways and quiet. And uh, at about 2, 3 in the morning, the day of the presidential debate, uh, we were released uh, from the warehouse Nobody on our campaign, our children, our families, and many Greens from across the country had no idea where we were for nine hours. And then I came to understand very seriously that we have a very serious democracy problem in our country. And something has to be done. In order for us to begin to take our country back, we have to get serious about developing this independent political motion in this country. Corporations now are determining whether or not we have water, whether or not we can breathe, whether or not we can have a house to live in, whether or not we're going to have jobs. And just as revolutionary as the invention or the discovery of fire was, 
electronics and technology is having serious impact on all of our lives and the next generations to come. In my neighborhood in Kensington, where you used to be able to walk down the street and get seven different jobs, you know, on any given day during the industrial period, no factories exist. Jobs are gonna to continue to either go south, leave the country, or now we have jobs that robots are doing, like General Motors in Detroit, where it used to be thousands of workers, and now you walk into those factories and they're all being, all the work is being done by robots. So we're gonna have harder questions to ask as a society. If I'm not able to go and work on a car at Ford, Ford Motor Plant, does that mean that I don't deserve food, clothing, and housing? Well, I hope that this next generation says it loud and says it now and gets organized that no, we will not tolerate a society that doesn't feed, clothe, and house its people. I think that, um, I'm gonna start wrapping up now, um, but I think that we definitely are at a tipping point right now in history. And it's us, up to us to decide which direction we're gonna go in as a society. We have to decide whether or not we're gonna have a society that values human beings, or is gonna to continue to let corporate greed determine what's gonna to happen to the people, the planet, and whether or not we have peace. Everything is political now in the United States, but even our politics are apolitical. Rugged individualism is going to kill us. We need to start working with each other and caring about what happens to the people on our block, in our church, in our mosque, and in our neighborhood, and in our country, and in the world. We must be brave like our ancestors. We must begin to speak truth. Our truth is gonna be the thing that is going to set us free. We have to really throw out old ways of organizing because it's a new time in history. And we have to become the pioneers, like we are trying to pioneer in Philadelphia. If you're homeless, get into an organization and house yourself. If you're hungry, get together with other people and plant food and feed yourself. And lastly, we, can, we cannot take over uh, a group of folks that are studying around the clock with their think tanks. We have to get serious about studying who we're up against. So you need to form the study circles that we have done throughout history. Together at the United States Social Forum, for four days we will map out a plan to take our country back. I hope you will join us. Together, we will not say it's okay to have a 10-year plan to end homelessness. Damn it, we need a plan to end it today and tonight. <laughs> and as some of my friends mentioned earlier tonight, we will have a march against austerity and for prosperity. Not saying that homelessness has to do with the person that doesn't have any work ethics, but telling the truth, linking uh, gentrification and the lack of affordable housing and no employment with the issue of homelessness. 
We are starting a new underground railroad. We are beginning to do what you're not supposed to do, which is to break unjust laws in order to keep people alive. We will win because we are coming together. We are getting serious against all odds, and we are creating that new world. As Langston Hughes said, I am so tired of hearing people say, let things take their course. Tomorrow is another day. I do not need my freedom when I'm dead. I cannot live on tomorrow's bread. Freedom is a strong seed planted in a great need. I live here too. I want freedom just as you. Let's take back our freedom. Let's become a country free from unemployment, hunger, and homelessness. This country has enough to go around, and it's time they start sharing. Thank you very much. Yes. Sure. Yes. My name is Nadine. Hi, Nadine. And I have a lot of ideals on the things that you're talking mm -hmm. about. And I've been homeless for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I know how DSS and APS and all of them relate to our income. Mm -hmm. A couple of months ago, they took my whole check, mm -hmm. my whole food stamps, and they've done it over and over and repeatedly. I'm fully disabled. I can't stop them and I can't fight them. But I have some good ideas and I'm not afraid. Okay, mm -hmm. so I would like to know how to get in touch with you and tell you what I know because our communication is the beginning of your whole plan. And, and just some advice, Nadine. Anytime they begin to tell you to shut up, you got to speak louder. Okay, next. Uh, I feel that... that uh, there's a lot of gun violence in, in, in America. Today and uh, yesterday in Troy, some youth went around to shoot weapons and cars and one person got injured on Ingalls and 7th Avenue there and, and so forth. I feel that people should be responsible about peace in our community and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I do, uh, what do you feel about full employment for all people and, and, you know, and so forth? And I feel that people should have affordable housing uh, uh, in, the, in their community on their income. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know how to end gun violence. We need to create a future for our youth. And then it's done. Uh, you know, uh, I. You know, when you, those, thi those things where you like turn in your gun and you get like some groceries or whatever, um, I want people to turn in their gun and get full employment and a living wage. When my daughter was five and we lived on the south end of Albany, she, she said to me, if we just gave people a good place to live and enough food, they wouldn't be drug selling on the street. I was like, when, when are you going to run for mayor? <laughs> so, I hope you've set up a plan for her. She's 27. She's in Oakland. She's, she's going to be a midwife. Um, very proud of her. But um, I, work for the, against, I, I work with the Coalition Against Sexual Assault and what you sp shared about domestic violence. I just was, I, I had wanted to speak to it earlier, but they were, I didn't want to go over time, we had a lot of speakers at the open mic. The trauma histories of most of the folks on the street, as we know, or maybe don't know, is usually pretty deep. Mm -hmm. And yet agencies like mine mm -hmm. aren't always making that a big, prominent 
connection. Mm -hmm. And so I, because I do this sexual assault mental health project, mm -hmm. I've made it my business to make it a connection. It's called Building Connections, my project. So I got asked to be at this New York, this big conference in New York City a few years ago, ICPH, Institute for Children, Poverty, and Homelessness. Mm -hmm. And it was the only, one of the only workshops on trauma at the whole friggin' conference. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. I just don't get it. So that, I guess I'm out of time. Okay, um, this is a, a crucial point. Um, we have an entire tent on uh, trauma and healing uh, at the social at the U.S. Social Forum. Um, I'm, you know, uh, I said earlier today to Virginia I was going to write a book, but I'm actually going to write an encyclopedia. Um, and one of the volumes should be on trauma. Um, you know, as as a young woman, I was also, you know, very. Um, uh, I was in the sex industry for many, many years and uh, uh, didn't almost survive many horrible experiences. Um, and I think one of the most important pieces that we can give uh, victims of trauma right now, uh, whether it's veterans returning home um, or it's women that have been in the sex industry that have, or victims of domestic violence, uh, is teaching them how to heal through struggle. Um, and so I think it's incredibly important. You, you want a woman to heal or a veteran to heal, you get them involved in this army. And uh, it's a real healing process. Because if you teach people, you know, who the person is that keeps throwing the babies in the water, as opposed to saving each of the babies, you teach them how to identify who's doing it, um, it's an important process. Finally, somebody my age. <laughs> How you guys doing tonight? My Good. name is Uriah Lovelace, and I'm 18 years old. My birthday was March 20th. I've been studying the government since I was about 12 years old. I know a lot about the George and Al Gush poll election, the butterfly polls. And I've also studied the groups of anonymous. I've studied all the secret organizations from Skull and Bone to, uh, to the Illuminati to the Freemasons. I've studied all of them. And I one day hope to get into politics to change the world. Woo! And I know the first step to that, I know the first step to that is being heard. Mm -hmm. I'm a known person around here. I lived here all my life, born and raised. When I was a young kid, I used to fight all the time. Used to have to fight. Mm -hmm. Just because kids always wanted me. They always wanted to target me. I was bullied. But I started sticking up for myself because I'm a brother of four. And as I got older, I realized that the real enemies weren't the people who were attacking me on the streets. They were the people that were giving them them thoughts. The rap industry, the music industry, you know, the MTV, all that. And I just realized that one day I need to change the world. And I just had my daughter, my first daughter. Her name is Faith Hope Lovelace. Aww. Named after my favorite part of the Bible. First Corinthians paragraph 13, last verse. These three remain, faith, hope, and love. And in the Bible it says we have faith that can move mountains. Right. How were the pyramids built? People. They weren't built with people with ropes. It's impossible. You want to know how it was built? Through the higher consciousness, through the Holy Spirit, to a higher, to an interdimensional. The Virgin Mary. I'm sorry. Have a good night. You have a good night, too. I can't hear you. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, no, I can. Yeah. Um, I've been homeless before, and I went through the struggle and whatnot, but came back home. And then, whatever, this winter was bad. I was trying to stay on the stage, but I was a little nervous, so I was going real quick. So, but 
The winter was bad. Our pipes busted. Literally, the water coming out of the broken pipes was in frozen animation as they were coming out. So when I went down in the basement, you could actually see the water frozen in the air. All right, okay. I contact our landlady or not. She tries to pin it on us, but if you paid attention, it would have been from years and years of bad mistreatment of those pipes being like that. So it was whatever. My mom actually ended up going to court, settled out of it because this lady wanted us out. We wanted to be out. It's too cold. We got out and whatnot. Now this is serious. I've been homeless before. I've been through the system, stayed at Joseph House, went to Equinox, actually stayed at the Mission, then went to Equinox, stayed there for a couple of years, and then got my own apartment. Through medical situations, I had to come back home. All right, that was just on me though. But now it's my family, on me, my mom, my sister. What? How this system is made up, no one's trying to help me, help us. How, how are we supposed, okay, yeah, all right, the laws out there are stricken against us, mm -hmm. but how are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to survive without breaking these laws, mm -hmm. without doing a little bit of something to support me? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I care for all you guys, but I'm just, I'm seriously just thinking about my situation, because mm -hmm. this is serious. I don't know how to handle all this stress. This is crazy. I'm about to this close to losing it, mm -hmm. and I just need someone to hear me, someone to, because we need housing. We have nowhere to stay right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, we try to stay with our grandmother, but that's a one-bedroom house. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make any sense, and we don't want to make put her out of her own place, mm -hmm. and so we're just trying to do what we got to do, but I need help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, you should take a flyer. And it's got my contact information on there. And, and I'm sure somebody's in this, ha in this hall here heard you loud and clear. And somebody's going to figure that out or I'm going to have to come back up here. Okay? So you call me if it doesn't happen. All right? But since I don't believe in charity... I believe in building a movement to end poverty in this country, that as soon as you have a place to sleep, you got to figure out how to help other people and build this movement. All right? Thank you. Um, and I would write your story, too, uh, because, uh, you know, this is a human rights violation, right? Uh, not having, uh, being a young man trying to survive in the richest country in the world, uh, you need to tell that story because your story is going to inspire a lot of other young people that um, don't have the bravery that you have to stand in front of a group of people and tell the truth. And the only way we're going to change things in this country if people start to tell the truth. And I can't tell you how many housing projects and groups of young people I've spoke to, they rather talk about any other identity issue in the world. But they won't tell you me and my mom don't have a place to sleep tonight because of the shame. And so in order for us to change things in the world, we have to stop being ashamed of being poor and we have to be ashamed of a country that doesn't do a damn thing about it. <laughs> 